Hey everyone, this is Robert Keats of goldsilverpros.com. A very special returning guest to the program, Alex Newman of Liberty Sentinel. Alex, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thank you very much for having me, Robert. Absolutely. Appreciate having you back at the Monterey Metal Summit in August. You guys did an excellent presentation. Both you and Rob Kirby came on and we're talking about the new economy. And it was the most popular segment at the conference. So I wanted to bring you back because we have uh, some a big event coming up next week with the presidential election and wanted to wanted to talk about that election a little bit and get your thoughts on uh, based on the, the outcome of that election, maybe some changes that we could see coming uh, for 2021. So why don't we get started there? Just your general thoughts leading up to the election and, and what you're seeing. Well, my observation has been that the level of support for Donald Trump is massive. It's off the charts and it doesn't fit with what the media is selling with the fake polls and with, uh, you know, you see these Biden rallies and maybe they've got 20 people there and half of them are probably staffers and at least another third are probably security. And then you see these Trump rallies. We had one not far from where I live where you've got, you know, tens of thousands of people flocking from all over the place, just cheering and enthusiastic. Uh, I was in a town last night for a speaking event in Sebring, Florida. And they were they had counted the cars, they had, had a Trump caravan, <clears throat> they had rounded up 327 vehicles to participate. Then they had a Biden caravan, they got five cars, one motorcycle and one pickup truck. So I think in a fair election, Donald Trump would absolutely clobber uh, Joe Biden. In fact, I have no doubt about that. And this has been the case even in, in blue states. I, I drove up the East Coast over the summer. Uh, you know, even the states where they say Biden is ahead, Pennsylvania, it was just a sea of Trump signs everywhere you looked. And, and you know, I don't think these are secret Biden supporters putting out Trump signs in their front yard. You know, it's just silly. But um, I think, you know, it, it's such a cliche to say this election is the most important one in, in history. Um, unfortunately, it becomes truer and truer with every election because the government is more huge, more powerful, controls more money, more aspects of our lives. So, yeah, each election becomes more and more important because the government becomes more and more uh, powerful and influential over your life. But this really, I think, is, a, is kind of a referendum on the future of civilization. Uh, do we want to go in the direction of uh, socialism of Cuba, of North Korea, of Vietnam, of China, of the Soviet Union, or do we want to at least kind of return to our roots as a, a free, independent nation? And, you know, I, I'm not going to say I agree with Donald Trump on everything. I certainly don't. But uh, I think he's got the a love for the country. We can put it that way. I think he does really love America. He does oppose globalism, and I think that's why the establishment hates him so much. You know, it's fine to be a fake conservative as long as you're down with the globalism, and Trump has kind of taken a wrecking ball to the machinery of globalism. So I think either way, there's going to be massive changes coming. Uh, if President uh, Trump gets another term, uh, I think the real swamp draining will hopefully begin, but the opposition and the resistance, so-called, that we saw during the last four years will look like child's play. Uh, I think if you live in a Democrat state with a Democrat mayor and a Democrat governor, watch out. I mean, these people have made crystal clear they have no interest in protecting your life or your property. They have all the interest in allowing rioters and looters to burn down cities and burn down churches and terrorize police officers and burn down small businesses. So, um, yeah, I, I think you, re you really need to watch out. And if you're in a red state with a red governor and a red mayor, you'll probably be better off. Um, you know, I know, for example, um, Oklahoma, Idaho, Florida, you know, you go try to burn down a city, you'll find yourself in jail pretty quick. Um, now, if uh, Biden wins, I think we will move very rapidly in the direction of keeping his campaign promises that we're going to have bigger government, we're going to have more taxes, we're going to do massive levels of gun control, we're going to, he said his, his top uh, priority legislatively was the Equality Act, which is essentially a bill to unleash federal persecution against Christians and against religious people uh, who don't agree with the LGBT agenda. If you read the text of the legislation, it is overtly hostile to religion. And they say that uh, your, your religious freedom defense won't work against this statute. You must bow down to the LGBT agenda. You must hire uh, homosexuals and transgenders to work at your church or whatever. Or the federal government's going to come and take away your nonprofit status, and they're going to file lawsuits against you. So it's going to be some massive change if, if Biden wins. 
But in tandem with that, I think we will see a, a renewed opposition like the Democrats have never seen before. You know, for too long, conservatives have just rolled over. Oh, well, the federal government said, oh, well, the Supreme Court said, I guess, you know, where our hands are tied. I think those days will probably be over. I think we'll start seeing uh, Republican governors and Republican legislatures and sheriff's department, including Democrat sheriffs, saying, no, sorry, you're, you're not taking guns from our constituents. No, sorry, you're not going to be doing that in our state. Uh, and we've, we saw a lot of that during Obama. We kind of saw it bubbling to the surface where you had states passing laws that uh, made it a crime for the feds to come in and violate people's rights where sheriffs were I mean, you had some states where every single sheriff in the whole state said you know pass all the gun control you want it's not going to be enforced in our county so i think we will see a dramatic resurgence of that and uh, you know no matter what happens i think on the economic front expect a whole lot more turbulence expect a massive decline in the value of the dollar expect a, a catastrophic wave of business bankruptcies uh, you know, they've been able to paper over this for a while, but we've got 60 million people who've lost their jobs since the start of these insane lockdowns. We've got, um, you know, according to the Bureau of Economic Analysis, over a 33 percent decline in GDP in the second quarter of 2020. Uh, you know, the economic effects that are, that are going to start being felt, I think, more severely in the months after the election are going to be, I think, cataclysmic. So, yeah, a, a whole lot there for us to work with. So first question I want to ask you about draining the swamp. I know that Trump hasn't been able to drain the swamp as much as a lot of his supporters had hoped he would based upon his campaign promises for 2016. A lot of that has to do with, I think he has a hard time identifying who's in the swamp because the swamp doesn't just come out and announce, hey, I'm, I'm you know, I'm here to, uh, you know, foil the, foil the constitution. And uh, they, they do, they're very deceptive about it. And I don't know if he has the level of discernment by himself needed, you know, to necessarily drain it by himself. And one thing I'm concerned about is Barr. I'm not convinced that Barr's, you know, the right guy because I think there's a lot of information available to him. And I think maybe more swamp training could have been done already. Do you think he needs to replace Barr and maybe some other members of his administration in order to actually do this uh, if he gets elected again? Absolutely. Barr, Barr should have never been there. In fact, uh, you know, he talks a good game. If you listen to his speeches, you're like, wow, this guy gets it. And But you know what they say, the old cliche, uh, actions speak louder than words. And his actions are screaming right now. I'm a deep state swamp creature. I'm a deep state swamp creature. Don't worry, deep state. I've got your back. I've got you covered. I'm going to talk a good game. I'm going to go give speeches. I'm going to give media interviews that makes it look like I care, makes it look like I'm doing something. But really, I'm going to protect all of the criminals. How can we have this Hunter Biden laptop is just one example uh, with evidence of uh, child pornography, with evidence of Biden's shady business deals, with evidence that uh, the Biden family was in bed with hostile foreign powers that now have blackmail material on them. How can we, I mean, this is not just a you know political, this isn't even standard corruption. You know, okay, rob money, all right? It, it, steal money and leave the rest of us alone. That's one thing. This is now a, a major national security threat. Uh, I have a recording of Hunter Biden talking about he, he was a partner with the actual spy chief of communist China. What in the heck are you thinking? This is the most murderous dictatorship on the planet. They have generals that have threatened to nuke hundreds of our cities. You've got to be kidding me. And yet the Justice Department is nowhere to be found. They're sleeping at the wheel. And, you know, we've got smoking gun evidence of treason committed during the Obama administration. And I don't use that term lightly. I know a lot of people throw it out there. Oh, I just disagree with you. So you're a traitor. No. Take, for example, the 2012 memo out of the Defense Intelligence Agency, the Department of Defense's Intelligence Agency, where they are talking about Syria. Okay, this memo was read by Hillary Clinton. They say in the memo, the revolution in Syria is led by, they say the primary force driving the insurgency in Syria is Al-Qaeda in Iraq and the Muslim Brotherhood. Okay, that's their words. And then they say, oh, yeah, by the way, we're supporting this revolution. Wait, so you're supporting a revolution led by al-Qaeda? That's what it says in the document. And then they say, one of the things that we want as supporters of the revolution, they're talking about the Obama administration, the UK, Turkey, France, uh, some of the uh, Sunni Arab dictatorships on the Arabian Peninsula. Um, one of the things that we want is the creation of what they call a Salafist principality in eastern Syria. Okay, they got it. We call it ISIS. And Trump knows this. He was on the campaign trail saying Obama and Hillary created ISIS. They are the actual creators of ISIS. And the media said, oh, that's crazy. He's, he's just out of, out of his mind. Well, then Trump released a document that we had been reporting on for, for months before, and suddenly the media went silent. You know, it's one thing to disagree politically. It's another thing to openly help and arm and support Mm -hmm. a terrorist organization that we've supposed, I mean, have we been in a terror war for the last, what, 
20 years now, and you are going to be helping the supposed terrorist group that we're waging war against? Their only defense, I think, would be, well, Congress never declared war on al-Qaeda. Yeah, okay, good defense. I'd like to see you make that in front of a jury. But why aren't these people being prosecuted? As long as you have open treason, as long as you have open sedition, open corruption, open vote fraud, and no accountability and no prosecutions, not only will it continue, it will get worse. And under Barr, nobody has been prosecuted. I mean, all these people that were spying on Trump, they're still running around. Peter Stork, Lisa Page, I mean, the, the former directors of the FBI, John Brent. These people are all running around. They're making huge amounts of money. They're signing book deals. They're commenting on television. Uh, and the American people are, are just left dumbfounded thinking, what in the world is going on? Barr has got to go. Uh, in fact, I think Sessions was doing a much better job than Barr. Uh, I think he made a huge mistake by recusing himself from the fake uh, Russia collusion crazy conspiracy theory of the establishment. That was a mistake. And, and I think everybody sees that. But uh, Barr has been significantly worse. He's got to go. Yeah. I want to turn attention to the economy for a moment. The last presidential debate, there was kind of a bombshell dropped, which I don't think the media, of course, is covering, uh, maybe covering up. But Biden talked about ending the oil and gas industry. And I think that was to uh, cater to or pander to the Green New Deal movement part of his constituents constituency of the Democratic Party. What happens to the U.S. if we end oil and gas all of a sudden without viable alternatives? Well, California is what happens to the U.S. Um, I just I got off the phone last night with a lady who's in California. She said, we haven't had power in three days and uh, they're blaming it on the fire. Okay. This is craziness, right? Uh, you have a, a supposed advanced economy, California, where they can't even keep the power. I mean, it's like Venezuela all over again, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now, Venezuela destroyed the oil and gas industry through socialism. Here, they're talking about doing it through mandate, but the effect will be the same. All the windmills and solar panels in the world are not going to power an industrial civilization where people have gotten used to their air conditionings and their cars. And I mean, it, it's just absolute poppycock. Now, will they actually do it? They're going to be very difficult, um, but I do think they would like to try. And I think part of the reason for this is just self-interested cronyism. You've got a lot of the elites fully invested in green energy scams. You know, they're depending on these crony handouts and subsidies. Uh, and, you know, oil is a competitor to that. Oil also liberates humanity in, in an incredible way. Mm -hmm. You know, oil is this abundant, plentiful uh, fuel source that has basically liberated mankind from back-breaking labor. Uh, instead of having to go out and plow our fields by hand or plow our fields with a horse or a donkey or an ox, uh, we can use tractors. Um, you know, instead of having to, to do all this huge labor by ourselves, we can build big machines and power them with fuel, right, with, with uh, fossil fuels. And to get rid of that would, would essentially take humanity back, uh, you know, to, to the pre-industrial revolution. It's crazy talk. It's absolute crazy talk. And the idea that we're going to be able to uh, supply all our needs with windmills and, and stuff like that, it, it's just absolutely ludicrous. And I, I think the guy who explained it best, I interviewed uh, Dr. Patrick Moore. He's one of the co-founders of Greenpeace for a while. He was the president of Greenpeace Canada. Uh, you know, and, and he's still a hardcore environmentalist. But uh, he said, basically, this Green New Deal is a recipe for mass suicide. You're talking about ending fossil fuels, that would mean mass suicide for humanity. We would have billions of deaths around the world. And ironically, since this is all under the guise of saving the environment, uh, I, I got a kick out of what Patrick Moore says. It shows you what an environmentalist is. He's like, yeah, basically all people would die. But even worse than that, I'm even more concerned about the fact that since we didn't have energy, all these people before dying, they'd go out and cut down every tree they could find to burn for heat, to burn to cook their food. So not only would all the humans die, we would cut down all the trees. Um, these people are absolute stark raving mad. And, uh, you know, under, under normal circumstances in a normal civilization, we'd put people like that in a rubber room. Right. I mean, they're talking about destroying our civilization. They're talking about people dying through these insane policies. And yet here they are running for president, running for Congress, running for Senate. Uh, and they're in control of some of our states. It's absolute lunacy. Yeah. And I think a lot of us are, you know, we're receptive to the environmental arguments because we all live in this environment. And, and I'm happy to move away from coal, oil and gas and other fossil fuels where we have alternatives. We just haven't developed other alternatives. So what you're talking about is basically ending uh, society as we know it, ending the Industrial Revolution, ending the tech society that we have, and all the modern conveniences we have, which would result in people not being able to cope for doing this radical plan before we have alternatives. So I would like to see investment in alternatives, you know, hydrothermal, thorium as a potential safer uh, nuclear option. Those are the types of things before we just talk about ending this current situation. And, and I agree with you, it's not logical to take that stance. Um, something that we talked about before the interview started was uh, election fraud. 
This is something bought, brought up repeatedly by Trump in the debates and by his campaign about the mail-in voting scheme and uh, you know people going around soliciting votes and things like that. And it was downplayed by the mainstream media and the Democrats. But I think you have a story to tell about something that happened recently in Florida. So if you could give us that story. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and let me go back just for a moment to, to the issue of fossil fuels and pollution. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, clearly, I think everybody on Earth wants a better environment, but I, mm -hmm. I completely reject the fundamental premise of this whole charade, and that is that carbon dioxide is pollution. Uh, yes. I've been going to these UN climate summits for over 10 years now. I go as a reporter. I've interviewed many of the UN's own scientists from their UN intergovernmental panel on climate change, including some of the top guys there. I've interviewed some of the top scientists in the world. I interviewed Donald Trump's climate advisor, uh, who spent two years on the National Security Council, Dr. William Happer, a physics professor at Princeton. What he told me was, and I've got it on camera, it's on YouTube, anybody can find it. Um, the earth is starving for more CO2. Uh, he says there's a massive shortage of CO2 right now. If we go too much lower, all life on the planet will die. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't realize because they've been brainwashed in school. CO2 is not pollution. It's an odorless, colorless gas. It is essential to all life. Every human exhales about two pounds of it on an average day. Plants use it for photosynthesis, and then they turn it into energy. They turn it into their growth. Uh, and, and it's a wonderful cycle of life. You know, we, we used to learn that it was the gas of life. Now the children are being taught that it's a pollution. It's toxic. It's going to kill us absolutely ridiculous. And farmers pump it in their greenhouses because they know plants grow significantly better with two, three, four, even five times the level of CO2 in the atmosphere as they do uh, just outside. So I think the whole premise of the war on uh, fossil fuels, so-called, and I think there's even some legitimate debate about whether they ought to be called fossil fuels, rests on a fraudulent premise. Mm -hmm. Because again, with communists and with totalitarians, there's the old saying, the issue is never the issue. The issue is always the revolution. Mm -hmm. If these totalitarians truly believed that carbon dioxide was bad, they would go to China. China emits far more CO2 than any other country. Under the Paris Agreement, they promised they were going to continue increasing their emissions of CO2 every year until at least 2030. Meanwhile, America is supposed to commit economic suicide because apparently CO2 emissions from China don't hurt the environment, but CO2 emissions from America, which are already dropping like a rock, do hurt. So it's, you know, I, I reject the whole idea that CO2 is bad for us. I think CO2 is great. The more we can get, the better off we would be. But like you, I'm, I'm more than happy to see the free market work. If people invest in alternative sources of energy that are more cost effective, like uh, different forms of nuclear power, yes, let's do it. You know, that's part of, a, part of a free market. Money goes where it can earn higher returns. If we do start getting a shortage of oil, which is one of the arguments they make, the price of oil will rise. Uh, it'll make sense to invest in other technologies. So I'm all about... Uh, other forms of energy, but they should be economically viable without government subsidies. Um, and so now to, to the question of election fraud, um, you know, I, I think we are going to see massive levels of election fraud. We had that here in Florida. Uh, in Broward County, these criminals were just creating more and more votes until they thought they had enough to get their candidates elected. We saw the same thing in Alabama when they tried to stop uh, Judge Roy Moore from winning that Senate seat. I'm convinced he won that Senate seat, and I'm convinced that those two or three Democrat counties, they kept finding more Democrat ballots and more Democrat ballots and more Democrat ballots until they could finally push their far left radical uh, Jones over the finish line. I think that's exactly what we're going to see here with this Biden election if they think they can get away with it. Now here in Florida, our governor removed the Looney Tunes that were running the election system down in Broward County, and they actually put in a prosecutor to say, hey, anybody tries this again, you're all going to prison. But Unfortunately, that's not what's happening in states like Illinois. That's not what's happening in states like California. That's not what's happening in states like Illinois. They know they have no fear of prosecution because they're one party states. They're run by criminals. So they know, hey, we can burn down cities, we can terrorize police officers, we can rig the vote, and nobody's going to prosecute us. A lot of these uh, these uh, prosecutors, these district attorneys were put in place with George Soros money. He's been pouring huge amounts of money into these prosecutorial races. Why? Why would he be doing that? Well, of course, the answer is obvious, because he doesn't want his rioters and he doesn't want his vote fraud artists to be prosecuted. So it's, it's a huge threat. Trump, uh, Trump is absolutely right to be talking about this. And, uh, and I think the Department of Justice, if we had a real attorney general, they would be throwing the book at people involved in this. So I think that's probably the biggest risk of this election is that the Democrats in jurisdictions where they think they can get away with it will stuff the ballot boxes to the point where they might be able to find enough to push Biden over the edge if the landslide isn't you know just of epic proportions. And that's a big danger. And if the legitimacy of the election is called into question, 
I think that's a very real possibility. Uh, you know, we've seen what happens in other countries when the election results, the legitimacy of the election results is called into question. It very rarely ends well. Yeah, that's something I wanted to speak to you about. We also had, I think it came out on Zero Hedge yesterday, there was a case in Texas of uh, vote solicitation by people that were going around to senior citizens and making, well, well, here's what they would do. They'd make friends with the senior citizens and then they would come back and say, hey, why don't I go ahead and take your vote for you? So they grab their ballot and they would change the, the result or fill in the result for the senior citizen, not what the senior citizen wanted to put on their ballot. And then they're taking those, of course, to the, to the poll places to have those ballots counted. So we're getting, and, it, and it's particularly evil because they're hiding under the guise of here, I'm a good Samaritan, I'm here to help you. But really what they're trying to do is, is steal the election. And that kind of news coming out is, put, I think, going to create a lot of anger, regardless of what the election result is. And we're just assuming that the election result is determined on November 3rd, that there's not going to be this big investigation and some recounts and, and, and a big battle coming. Do you see a big battle coming based upon some of this uh, fraud that's now coming out before the election? Do you think the, you know, the Trump campaign is going to call into, into question this? And do you think that it's going to rely on the, the Supreme Court maybe to make some sort of decision? Yeah, I, I think it's almost inevitable at this point that we are going to head for a protracted legal battle. Uh, there's going to be a, a fight in tons of states, legal fight. Both campaigns have already lawyered up. They've got massive numbers of lawyers on their payroll now preparing for this fight that's coming. It's going to be ugly. We're not going to know who won on November 3rd, almost certain. Uh, and the media has been getting us prepared for this. And the establishment has been preparing for this. So George Soros, uh, the neoconservative William Crystal, John Podesta, the weirdo who apparently goes to spirit cooking meetings with Marina Abramovich and a bunch of these other weirdos. Anybody who, who doesn't know about John Podesta, go look at the art that this creep keeps in his house. It is enough to have a barf bag handy. It is enough to make you sick. So these people all got together and they put together what they called the Transition Integrity Project. They claim to be nonpartisan because they found a couple never Trump rhino uh, globalist hacks to, to be Republicans. And they wargamed these various different scenarios. They came out with four different scenarios for what might happen. There's no scenario, surprise, where Trump just wins the election and walks back into the White House. There's only one scenario where Trump even wins in the Electoral College. And then what happens under their scenario is uh, unrest all over the country. The Democrats start making all these outrageous demands. We've got to abolish the Electoral College. We've got to turn Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico into a state. We're going to burn down your cities until you comply. We're going to have basically a revolution out in the streets. Uh, all three of the other scenarios, they expect Biden will win. And, uh, you know, one of the things that was interesting is they say if Trump starts talking about voter fraud, that's evidence that he's a dictator and we need the military to remove him. If Trump starts trying to quell the riots that we're going to be orchestrating in all the cities, and then I'll say we're going to be orchestrating, but it's very obvious. I mean, Soros has had a lot of these people on his payroll for many years. Uh, then that's more evidence that he's a dictator and we need the military to remove him. So there are now plans being made for uh, what I call a color revolution. In fact, it's not my term. Uh, the State Department, the Central Intelligence Agency, the George Soros-funded uh, non-governmental organizations, the uh, Democracy Endowment, all these other uh, shady groups, they've been running these color revolutions in Eastern Europe for decades now, and not just Eastern Europe, also North Africa, Middle East, etc. cetera. Uh, the same people are now making the same type of preparations here in the United States. Uh, we had two lieutenant colonels retired, uh, sent an open letter to General Mark Milley, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff saying, hey, if it comes to it, you're going to have to give the order to have the military escort Trump out of the White House. And frankly, I'm very concerned about Mark Esper, uh, the defense secretary. This guy's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. That is like deep state swamp headquarters on American soil. Hillary Clinton said publicly in a speech to the CFR, they tell her what she should be doing and how she should be thinking about the future. Uh, Joe Biden was up on stage in that same talk where he admitted he used a billion dollars of U.S. taxpayer money to have the prosecutor in Ukraine removed who was investigating Burisma Holdings where his son was serving on the board. He bragged about it in that same talk right at the very beginning. The president of the Council on Foreign Relations, Richard Haas, was introducing himself. And you can see this on YouTube. Uh, he says, hi, I'm Richard Haas. I work here at the Council on Foreign Relations. And Joe Biden says, and I work for Richard. And yet Trump's defense secretary, Mark Esper, comes from this subversive globalist organization and has already said, I don't think Trump ought to invoke the Insurrection Act. Hey, 22 times the Insurrection Act has been invoked by American presidents. Um, you know, I, I am very concerned about the use of the military on American streets. I don't think it should happen except under the most dire circumstances. But there's one thing that's even more dangerous than having federal troops. Uh, doing something in the United States, putting down an insurrection. And that is an insurrection. That is a Marxist revolution that takes over parts of cities like we saw in Seattle. It's absolutely unacceptable. 
The people of Seattle, the people of Portland, the people of New York City, they're American citizens. They have a right to be secure in their houses, papers, and effects. They have a right to their property. They have a right to their lives. And if the governor and the mayor won't protect them from these communist revolutionaries, then President Trump has the obligation to come in. And yet you have the highest level military people implying, suggesting that they would go insubordinate and refuse to follow those orders. So I think they're setting us up here, Robert, for some very, very dangerous stuff. I don't know that whether they'll be successful, but I know they've got a lot of resources. They've got a lot of people on the inside. They've got most of the fake media in their pockets. So we are heading, I think, into some turbulent times, at least potentially. Yeah, I agree with you. And, and I would point out that I'm not sure the last two Supreme Court nominations by um, President Trump, uh, Kavanaugh and um, the new one, and the name is escaping me for a moment. Amy Cohen Barrett. Yeah. Hmm. I, you know, the research I've done on them suggests that perhaps they're not true conservatives. And uh, Brett Kavanaugh was on uh, Bart Starr's team and uh, it had some underhanded stuff going on there during his uh, during his investigation. So I'm not sure that these are really true conservatives. And I'm not sure that uh, Trump could rely on the Supreme Court. I wonder if they're potentially Trojan horses. I don't know if you're aware even of Gorsuch. Background, but what are your thoughts on the Supreme Court and would they support him? I, I, I agree with you. And I think even Gorsuch, there's some real serious questions. I mentioned the Council on Foreign Relations. Gorsuch was a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Now, there's two different types of memberships. There's life membership and term membership. I don't know the details of Gorsuch's membership. I don't know if they didn't invite him back or if he was like, no, you guys are a bunch of crazy globalist freaks. I want nothing to do with this or what. But he was on their records as a member for a time. That is a huge red flag. And mm -hmm. unless he specifically comes out and says, man, those guys are crazy. They're trying to sell our sovereignty out. They're trying to build what they call a new world order. That's a bad idea idea. I don't trust them. Uh, we've seen Gorsuch and Kavanaugh already coming down on the wrong side of multiple issues. Um, and so I, I share those concerns. Uh, John Roberts is another good example. You know, oh, a big conservative. And of course, he rules the wrong way on virtually every case at this point, whether he's being blackmailed or whether he just was a Trojan horse to begin with, I can't say. But, um, you know, I don't think Trump can count on the Supreme Court uh, any more than he can count on uh, the media. I mean, it's, uh, you know, a lot of these people, I think for an outsider who doesn't know how Washington works, um, you know, a lot of this doesn't make sense on the surface. Washington is a really, really shady place. You know, they were spying on Trump. They were spying on Trump's top people. This is the elected president of the United States of America. They were spying on their phone calls. They were reading their emails. If they'll do that to Trump, you think they won't do that to a member of the Supreme Court? You think they won't do that to a member of Congress? You think they won't do that to a reporter? This is how the deep state works. And everybody knows it. You had um, Chuck Schumer, the uh, the Senate minority leader. Um, he actually went on that, that weird show with that guy, uh, what's his name, Rachel Maddow on uh, PMS LSD. Uh, and, and he said, hey, the deep state, they've got seven ways from the intelligence communities. They have seven ways from Sunday to get back at you. He's talking about Trump. So, you know, it's, it's an open secret there. You cross these people, they will use any underhanded, immoral, illegal means to come after you. And they think they're above the law. They think they're above accountability. So, uh, you know, I don't think Trump can rely on the Supreme Court. And that's unfortunate. But, um, you know, he's a smart guy. He didn't get this far by not being a smart guy. And he, he understands uh, the way criminals operate. He came from New York. You know, you got to kind of be pretty street smart to, to make it in New York, especially at that level. And um, so Trump understands a lot. He knows a lot. But what he's up against is a monster of, um, of massive proportions. And I don't know that the Supreme Court will be reliable in upholding justice and, um, you know, making sure that there's honest rulings coming out about the election or anything else. Yeah, I agree with you. Fast forward to 2021, assume the Democrats win and Biden and Harris come into power. What do you think it looks like for the average citizen in 2021? What, what would we have to look forward to in that scenario? Well, what they've told us, I, I think, is a pretty good guide. Higher taxes, significantly higher energy prices, um, a drastic decline in the value of the U.S. dollar, even beyond what we've seen already. And I think that'll happen under Trump, too. I mean, that's kind of not in the president's hands anymore. That's the lunatics running the Federal Reserve uh, who've got that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think basically expect Obama on steroids. I think Obama would have been more than pleased to go further if he thought he could get away with it. You know, it's just you couldn't push the American people too far or it, it wouldn't be effective. So I think we'll see more of that. 
And, and you know, they've been very clear about what their objective is, Robert. They, they say over and over again, Joe Biden said, we want a new world order. He said it multiple times. Uh, if you look into what they mean by a new world order, they've been kind enough to define it for us. I mean, back in 1991, George H.W. Bush went on national television and told us what it is, a world effectively controlled by the United Nations, where UN peacekeeping forces will be used to implement the vision of the UN's founders, where we'll have global rule of law that will govern the conduct of nations. That is their objective. And, um, and what will this new world order look like? I think if you really want a picture of it, look at communist China. Uh, that, I think, is their model for their global technocratic system that they're building. And it's not just speculation. They've said it multiple times. Uh, George Soros, as an example, one of the key financiers of this move, uh, he has said over the years on multiple occasions, he says, communist China has a better functioning government than the United States of America does. Okay, yeah, I guess if you consider mass murder, persecution of churches, no rule of law, government control of all businesses, if you consider that a, you know, more effective government, then yeah, maybe they do. Uh, he also said communist China should own the new world order in the same way that the United States owns the current world order. Uh, you've got to David Rockefeller, even back in the 1970s, he wrote an op-ed in the New York Times saying that um, the experiment, the social experiment in China under Chairman Mao was one of the most successful and important in all of human history. It's still posted on the New York Times website. These globalists have been very clear about their objective. They want to remove the sovereignty of the United States. They want to end the individual liberties, the God-given rights of the American people. And they want the whole world to look a lot like China does now. Ruthless totalitarianism enforced through the more uh, gentle means like the social credit system and the cashless society and all the rest of it. But that is their ultimate objective. Now, how far they'll be able to get under a Harris-Biden administration, I think, remains to be seen. I think the pushback would be off the charts. Uh, like I said earlier, you know, I think we'll see governors growing a spine. I think we'll see sheriffs across this country growing a spine. Um, but, uh, you know, I do think no matter what happens with this election, we can expect continued division. We can con expect continued civil strife in the United States. And we can expect continued efforts by the deep state, by the swamp to sell the United States out, to sell out our sovereignty, to weaken our economy, to weaken our military, and ultimately to make us fodder for, uh, for the globalist agenda. So glad you bring up that up the globalist agenda. Um, don't want to make the interview too long, but it did what I want to cover that. So I've been covering this on the channel for a while. I started a series around the Great Reset. I know that you've been covering this for a while, so I wanted to get into it. There were recent remarks in October by managing director of the IMF, Kristalina Georgieva, talking about the Great Reset and some of the key words that they actually highlighted in the press release in case you know you missed it highlighting greener, smarter, fairer. So greener is Green New Deal, uh, socialism through uh, regulating carbon, through climate change initiatives. That's the code word there. Smarter is gonna be digitalization, it's gonna be technocracy, and fairer is stuff like universal basic income and those types of things, you know, all planks of the, the, Mar the Marxist manifesto, basically. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on the comments by her and the IMF and, and their role in all of this? Yeah, and, and Georgieva was actually there at the, uh, she was one of the four top speakers when they originally unveiled the Great Reset as well. So it was Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Prince Charles, and of course, the head of the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab. And I think if you listen to what they're saying, they're telling you what they want. They want a totalitarian global system where people will be serfs and they will be the ruling class. I mean, that's what they want. They've said it. And it gets even creepier than that, I think. Uh, if you listen carefully, Klaus Schwab, for example, talked repeatedly about the fourth industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay, you know, I had a nebulous conception of what that was. I went back and said, what did Klaus Schwab say about the fourth industrial revolution? Well, he describes it as the blurring the, uh, of uh, the biological systems and digital and physical systems. Uh, and so what he's talking about really is even transhumanism. Mm -hmm. um, at the World Government Summit a couple of years ago, they had a cyborg, a self-proclaimed cyborg come and speak. He had an antenna coming out of his head. And he claimed to be, you know, part man, part machine. You've got all over the world now. They're putting microchips in people as a means of payment, as a means of getting access to buildings. Uh, I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, Elon Musk came out and said he's going to saw holes in people's skulls and stick a brain chip in there and fuse it with your brain so that you don't have to whip out your smartphone all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you very much, but I think I'll pass. Um, one of the speakers, they had nine additional speakers when they unveiled this great reset project. You had, of course, the head of MasterCard. MasterCard is a huge promoter of the cashless society because, hey, we're going to get a cut of every transaction. That sounds nice. Plus, we'll be able to sell all your data and make another fortune, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the people they had was the CEO of a company called Chipsafe. And this company makes... Um, 
implants, technological implants that go in livestock that track the geolocation and the health of your animals. Well, I don't think that they invited the CEO of ChipSafe to speak because we're going to be putting this into all of our cows and into all of our sheep. I think their long-term objective, and they've been pretty clear about this, they're becoming more and more clear about it. They're putting the propaganda out on national television. Uh, they want to put that in humans. Mm -hmm. Okay, Microsoft just filed a patent this year, uh, WO 2020 It's right there on the World Intellectual Property Organization's website. It's for a piece of technology that you put on your body that monitors your body data activity and keeps track of your cryptocurrency allotments. Okay, that's the direction that these people are moving in. Uh, they're moving in toward transhumanism, toward technocracy. So, you know, what we, like at least our generation, Robert, grew up believing, you know, America, the land of the free, God-given rights and freedom of speech and religious liberty and the right to keep and bear arms, all that they hope to completely eliminate. The younger generations don't even know about this stuff. They hate free speech. They hate America. They're being trained to despise their family, to despise their country, to despise the church. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a recipe for total cataclysm. Now, will they win? I don't think so. Uh, certainly not over the long term. You know, I, as, a, as a Christian, I'm absolutely convinced these people are going to be completely crushed into dust. But in the meantime, I think it might get pretty ugly. For a lot of people, uh, especially people who don't agree with going on with this agenda, for people who are aware, for people who uh, kind of don't want to participate in this Orwellian nightmare. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think, you know, that, that's unfortunately the direction we're headed in. I do encourage people to uh, to find out more about this great reset. Uh, I've been writing about it and talking about it extensively. This is the direction that they're going in, and they've got all the elements of global power uh, backing them up. And so it's going to be a significant threat long into the future. Yeah. I agree with you. And I agree with you on the long game. I do think there's hope, uh, but a lot of people, you know, as I've been, a lot of my subscribers, as I've been uh, lecturing about this and, and talking about this on my channel and my articles uh, are looking for signs of hope and they're looking for potential solutions. So assuming this is not all written in stone that it's going to happen and that we have some say in the matter, what can people do? What are some solutions for people to do maybe politically, culturally, and even economically to kind of protect themselves from this moving forward as they start to wake up and see what's going on? Yeah, I feel like I'm just talking in cliches, but the cliches are so appropriate here. Knowledge is power, okay? It is, it's such a cliche, but it's so true. Get yourself informed. Find out what's going on. You know, Sun Tzu, the uh, military strategist, uh, had some really phenomenal insight thousands of years ago uh, into war. And, and if you don't realize we're in a war yet, I'm afraid you're not paying attention. We are in a war. Uh, the problem is, um, the people who don't agree with this really don't realize they're in a war yet, by and large. And so, Sun Tzu said, if you don't know yourself and you don't know your enemy, you're going to lose every single battle. And that's where America is right now. Even patriotic, you know, God-fearing, liberty-loving, constitution-supporting Americans don't realize, by and large, the nature of the war. We're in. It's starting to become a little more clear now. They're seeing you know, the attacks on Trump. They're uncomfortable with it. They see the fake media. But they haven't realized the totality of this. So we need to understand, first of all, our enemy. Who is it that's trying to enslave us? Who is it that wants to destroy our country and take our liberty? Who is it that wants to make us into economic serfs? They have names. They have organizations. They have addresses. We need to know who they are. We need to expose them, and we need to oppose them. Uh, we also need to know who we are as Americans, as human beings. Uh, if you don't know who you are, uh, you're going to be in big trouble, and, and that includes us as a nation. You know, your average young American today has no clue about the American founding, about our Declaration of Independence, about the pilgrims. They, they don't know any of that. All they know is slavery, slavery, slavery. And it, a lot of them actually think America invented slavery. So we have got to have a massive educational campaign. Uh, and it begins with us as individuals. We must get educated ourselves. And then from there, we can educate our families. We can educate our children. We can educate our neighbors, our communities, uh, our elected officials. Uh, and that radiates outward. I, I do think education is the most important important strategy. Uh, from a financial perspective, again, knowledge is power. Look at what's coming, look at what's going on and figure out ways to make money from it. Uh, I despise Amazon and I despise Walmart, but hey, I made a lot of money during the lockdown, just like Jeff Bezos, just like the Walton family, right? Mom and pop businesses couldn't operate, but hey, Amazon share prices doubled since the lockdowns while the Washington Compost owned by Jeff Bezos was fanning the flames of hysteria. So you got to see what they're doing, try to make money where you can. Uh, I like precious metals, but I recognize there's a huge risk. The government could come in and uh, do what they did like in the 1930s and pass an executive order and say, you got to hand them over. Uh, I also like firearms. I think firearms can be a good investment if that's uh, your thing. I don't think it would hurt to have some ammo. And, you know, as, as alarmist as it might sound, I don't think it would hurt you to have a little bit of extra canned food and uh, some supplies on hand in case things get really nasty. You know, if you live in Florida, you already know this because we go sometimes, you know, two weeks without power, two weeks without grocery store when the hurricanes come. Um, but, 
you know, there's other things that can happen other than hurricanes, civil unrest. You know, what if the truckers stop uh, driving into your community because there's a riot going on because there's police out in the streets? Well, you got to think about those things and uh, you got to make plans for your family. And so I, I think, you know, it's, it's critical that people start taking family seriously. That means, first of all, get your children out of the brainwash camps. Make sure they're getting a good education, either in a private school or a home school or something like that. Uh, make sure you're, you're doing your finances wisely. Don't be in a bunch of uh, ridiculous debt. You know, maybe a, a mortgage on your house. If you've got a fixed low interest rate, they're going to blow up the currency. Okay, you might be able to profit from that. But uh, just be wise um, and, uh, and, and use your head. So, yeah, I appreciate that. And I think you've been a big part of the edu educational campaign. I appreciate you doing what you do because you bring so much information out to us. And that's why I like to have you on the show. I feel like I learn something new every time you come on. Um, how can people get in touch with you at Liberty Sentinel Media if they want to follow your work? Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to come on. So libertysentinel.org.org is my uh, personal website. Uh, you can shoot me an email at alex at libertysentinel.org. I'm on Twitter at alex, alex Newman underscore J-O-U, uh, Facebook at Alex J. Newman 86. I'm on Parlor as Alex Newman and Liberty Sentinel. Um, and then uh, I write for a whole lot of different clients. I write for the New American. I write for the Epic Times. I write for the Illinois Family Institute, World Net Daily, Law Enforcement Intelligence Brief, Freedom Project Media. So you can find my stuff uh, all over the place. Um, YouTube hasn't deleted me yet, but I'm shadow banned. So if you look real hard, you can find stuff. And then uh, my latest book is called uh, Deep State, The Invisible Government Behind the Scenes. That'll be out on Amazon probably by the end of the week. So oh, great. Look forward to that. Thank you so much, Alex. Appreciate having you on the program. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it.